We grew up in them. Space Invaders, that was great. The games I really loved were Asteroids, Missile Command, and above all, Defender. But I loved uh, Robotron, and I thought that was a really you know, fantastic game. And they made a fortune, 25 cents at a time. We're talking about in 1981, Americans dropped 20 billion orders into arcade machines. They were the gaming world. It was really weird because it wasn't like a kid phenomenon. It was like really across the board phenomenon. Well, they popped up everywhere. But all good things come to an end. It was a fad. I think there's no other way to put it until finally, you know, the whole thing just sort of collapsed under its own weight. This is the story of the birth and fall of the arcade industry. Starting as far back as the late 1800s, penny arcade machines such as strength testers and peep shows dot local pubs and fairgrounds. In 1927, David Gottlieb creates Baffle Ball, the precursor to the modern pinball machine. His simple game sparks the pinball craze. Soon, the many arcades that grew out of the Great Depression are packed with pinball machines. For decades, pinball rules the arcades. But in 1971, a man named Nolan Bushnell changes everything. He wasn't much of an engineer, but he had these great ideas for doing businesses. He saw how he could take the technology we were using at Ampex and make a coin-operated amusement device that might be a, a hit. He then built this thing called Computer Space. Computer Space was not a great marketing success. Computer Space was a monumental flop. They made a thousand copies of it. They didn't sell all thousand copies of it. It wasn't popular, it didn't make it to very many venues, and where it did make it, it wasn't very popular. So he challenged me to do a ping pong game, a very simple, one moving spot. Nothing could be simpler. Al got it to the point where it just had the two paddles, and it was knocking the ball back and forth, and it was so much fun, I said, stop. We don't need to go to the next step. In 1972, the first Pong machine is placed in Andy Capp's pub in Sunnyvale, and from there, it becomes the world's first huge video game success. The average Pong machine pulls in $100 a week in quarters. Oh my God, it's everywhere. Oh my oh God, what have I done? Soon, Atari isn't the only big company making coin-operated video games. Cinematronics makes a name for itself by releasing a number of successful vector games. A vector game, or a vector display, actually just takes a single beam and the programmer or hardware directs it to go to this point to this point, and that draws a line. Among their releases is the world's first cooperative game, Ripoff, created by Tim Skelly in 1980. Ripoff was something that uh, we had come up with uh, just in kicking around some names for a game. And I had something that was kind of almost like centipedes in, in the back of my head. And I just decided that it would be more interesting if, instead of shooting at each other, that they both shot at the enemy. And believe it or not, market research said that cooperation amongst young people had become a, a major factor. And I thought, well, that's great. That fits right into my plans. So we made a cooperative game, and it became just a huge success and a great deal of fun to play. But the true arrival of the arcade is brought about by three key games. The first of these is Space Invaders, which is released in 1978. Space Invaders actually had gameplay that was interesting and actually had a scoring modality so a person could get a score and you could compete with someone else and compare your scores and therefore a person could become, quote, a video game champion. 
So Space Invaders was like the first game in this three game progression. With asteroids following close behind. Asteroids, it was me for project leader. There was only one programmer. There was a technician, the electrical engineer. I did the art, just line drawings basically, all the fonts and stuff. That was basically the entire team. Lyle Rains was, called me in his office and said, we had this game called Cosmos, I think it was, where it was a big rock on the screen. The idea was to shoot the other player, but the rock was in the way and people kept shooting the rock and he said, well, they keep shooting the rock and the rock and nothing happens. What if we put rocks on the screen and the player blows them up? And I said, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. Also, we need something to make the players come out more, so I suggested a saucer that would come out and take a shot of the player if he didn't do anything or if the number of rocks got real low. I just went out and did it, so you know, within a few weeks I had things floating around the screen. And Asteroid suddenly had further enhanced gameplay where people could get very high scores and also got the competition going for people playing against each other in a bigger way than Space Invaders started for high score laurels. And then Pac-Man is unleashed. But the final thing that really got it going was the third game in this progression, and that's Pac-Man. When Pac-Man came out, it caused everybody to fall in love with video games. Men, women, children, professional people, anybody, any walk of life, any age, became enamored with video games. And Pac-Man single-handedly brought the entire female audience into the arcade at the same time because of its uniqueness and because of its incredible across-spectrum appeal. Pac-Man was hit everywhere it went right off the bat. The success of Pac-Man, Asteroids, and Space Invaders opens the floodgates for the arcade revolution. And the gaming world will soon become more successful than anyone ever dreamed. By the early 1980s, arcades are everywhere. Well, they popped up everywhere. You know, 7-Elevens would carry them. Uh, by the time we get to the middle 80s, grocery stores are carrying them. The funny one, of course, is at least one funeral home had a couple of arcade machines in its basement. It was an incredible phenomenon at, at that time. In 1981, Americans dropped 20 billion quarters into arcade machines. They spent 75,000 years playing arcade games in 1981. The media takes notice as arcades become part of popular culture. But at this point now we've reached the peak where, you know, it was now okay for middle class people to go into arcades. The arcade crowd back in the old days was really weird because you definitely had all the little scrubs like me, you know, like little kids who were riding their bikes there. And then you had like high school students and you had college students. It was mostly the guys, but you had the girls kind of hanging there looking at what was going on. But then it was also really weird because you had like businessmen. You just have to be kids, didn't have to be young, didn't have to be, you know, just a slacker. It was really weird because it wasn't like a kid phenomenon. It was like really across the board phenomenon in terms of who was playing arcade games. I think the golden age was like in the early to mid 80s, you know, when you had like all the amazing Midway games and the Atari games, games like Joust, Robotron. The games I really loved were Asteroids, Missile Command, and above all, Defender. When Defender came out, that was like, changed the world. And thanks to people like Eugene Jarvis, creator of Defender and Robotron, the hits just keep coming. Eugene is a wild man. Eugene is a poster boy for something in our industry, I'm not sure why. Defender was cool because you'd see it and it was only the older kids could play it because it was so intimidating. There's like a thousand buttons. I remember like trying to play it a few times and I couldn't get anywhere with it. Defender was the ultimate game for the hardcore gamer. It had seven buttons. I mean, I, I don't think any other game had that degree of control complexity. Just trying to keep track of them would drive you crazy. I think my right pinky is still kind of, kind of crooked from having spent so many hours pushing that control up and down. I finally learned how to play it. That was pretty, I would describe that as a life-changing moment. And so we sat there and played it like the whole day, like, you know, until my mom dragged us out of there. 
but I loved uh, Robotron. And I thought that was a really you know, fantastic game. Robotron, which is one of my favorite games, I actually liked it so much I actually bought it. That's one of those games that you know, be shaking by the time I got back after playing for an hour. As the industry peaks, originality is a must. The golden age of the arcade was incredible. The creativity, I've never seen anything like it. Every game had to be original, 100% unique. This was the attitude at Atari. We didn't do driving games because there had been a driving game. If you did a driving game, it had to be a driving game with guns, and then there could only be one of those in the industry. I had a friend who made a driving game where you drove on the ceiling because that was the only way you could get it through this corporate culture where 100% originality was required. The business of gaming looks good. Like today, where they're talking about how the game industry is eclipsing uh, the motion picture industry in terms of revenue. That was very much the case back then as well. But the revenue from video games was enormous. I mean, a good game would bring in 800 to 1,000 in a week. So you'd buy the game, and then two weeks, you know, you pay off your, you know, the distributor and you're fine. And there were a lot of arcades, a lot of places where there were video games. But the market can only grow so much. Soon, the arcade reaches critical mass and becomes a victim of its own success. Ironically, when I arrived at Atari in 1982, we were saying, we're so big, the coin drop in these games is just as large as theatrical revenue for movies. Now, does that sound familiar? What had happened is we pretty much saturated the market. The games did not get obsolete very quickly, and we filled the arcades with them, and we were starting to fill secondary locations like Safeways and 7-Elevens and dentist offices. By the middle of 1982, we were just full. A lot of it was oversaturated in the market in 81, 82, especially 82-ish time frame. And we sold thousands and thousands of games that went into dentist office, you know, besides normal arcades and street locations like bars and restaurants and bowling alleys. And it got to the point there were so many games out there that they couldn't support the amount of earnings to really justify buying them. It was a fad. I think there's no other way to put it. It was like early rock and roll, really enough people started coming and enough companies started making games, it just kept growing, you know, and people built bigger and bigger ones until finally, you know, the whole thing just sort of collapsed under its own weight. Now, the arcade machines that were so successful just a year ago are no longer making enough money to support the market. By the time the early 80s came around, the economic life for a lot of games, were for simple games, and the simple games were those that everybody was playing. It was probably less than a year. Well, the games cost enough that they really needed to have an economic model that would last for several years in order to pay for them. And the home console market takes a bite out of the arcade as well. The other thing that people will point out is that their home console started getting better about this point. The Atari 800 and other stuff started coming out. And the consoles, you know, artwork used to be so different. You know, the arcade would be here and the consoles would be down here. The discrepancy started uh, narrowing and uh, they started affecting our business. Yeah, I definitely think the rise of the consoles really have hurt the arcade overall because there's just not much you can do on an arcade machine that you can't do on a home console. Bloodied and bruised, the arcade market looks like it's down and out. But only time will tell. By the mid-80s, the days of arcade games bringing in $1,000 a week are over, and the coin-op industry is a mere shadow of what it once was. Many companies, such as Cinematronics, are out of business. But Atari is still alive and still making arcade hits, such as Gauntlet and Marble Madness. Marble Madness was supposed to be uh, sort of a video game equivalent of miniature golf. But, you know, putting didn't make a whole lot of sense in that context, so it sort of uh, evolved. The graphics stayed intact, but it, it kept on evolving, and so we got the, the trackballs for controllers, and we got enemies in there blocking your path, and it went to a time basis, sort of became a race game. You know, we have resurgence when Gauntlet came out. Well, uh it came from several sources. My son was very much into D&D at the time. It was very hot stuff to do. And, you know, that's where the original concept came from. 
you'll come out with two good games right in a row, and it's like, oh, yes, you're right. All right. In 1991, the arcade experiences one of its greatest resurgences with Capcom's release of Street Fighter II. Fight. When the fighting games started to come back in the 90s, like there was like an upturn, and you did start to see machines going into weird places again. I spent a lot of money on Street Fighter. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Street Fighter series in its 2D incarnation basically has lived on until to this day. And there's something very compelling about that. After Street Fighter 2 came out, there were nearly 600 new fighting games, but none of them could go beyond Street Fighter. But as successful as the Street Fighter series and its fellow fighting games are, it isn't enough to fully revitalize the market. Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, these were games that took a lot of coordination and it excluded two major classes of people. The casual gamer, the businessman that wanted to play on his lunch hour, and women. They were very complex and so the casual gamer didn't want to spend their life figuring out how to punch, kick, and fight somebody to death and knock their heads off. The problem with fighting games was that if there was a period or maybe like a year where anyone could get into fighting games, and after that, it was hard for like somebody new to walk in the arcade and not just get their ass kicked and just get laughed out of the place. It was kind of a, a feedback loop that kept new people from getting into it after a while. To stay alive, the arcade must evolve. A single quarter was not enough revenue for a game to earn. We ultimately figured out that we needed a buck. And we don't have dollar coins in the States. A buck is a big spend. It's not a casual spend. And so we needed a new generation of arcade games to, to show how this should be done. And Yu Suzuki was the big player there. Hang On, OutRun, R360, he had it down. Yu Suzuki from Sega is considered one of the pioneers for arcade games in the early 90s. Yu Suzuki transformed the video game business. If you look at the period of time from when he started making these simulators through, say, 1995, Sega dominated the arcades. Since I created Hang On, a lot of people were getting more and more into games where you just don't use a joystick. It becomes a physical experience. You need a moving cabinet, that was very important, and the hardware manufacturers were challenging more and more complicated movements. Well, it just makes the experience all the more real, right? I think what it does is it tends to heighten the gameplay experience. It takes some imagination to kind of, you know, put those things together. The arcade industry is great because of, you know, these unique things. I think this is more pushing the envelope of human capacity rather than of the industry itself. With a normal console, right, you know, you're just kind of limited to your, your controller, I and mean, there's some add ons. Like for uh, Dance Dance Revolution or games like that, to have that custom piece of equipment, it adds a whole nother gameplay element, a whole nother experience, and it takes it to a deeper level. While it looks like the arcade may never reclaim its former glory, some people still think it has a future. I think what you're going to see in terms of arcade games in the future is just more things that are like uh, the larger machines. Like ride simulators. You know, there's something about a driving game where you actually have a steering wheel and pedals that you can't really duplicate at home, even with the wheel and pedals, and uh, and just the larger kind of location-based entertainment machines. Yeah, there is. There are arcades out there, and Sega actually was very forward-thinking in this. Theme parks, or even just, you know, say, like on a boardwalk somewhere, or specifically downtown somewhere, there's a big game center. But the idea there is to give you an experience that you can't get at home. I always thought there was a future. I just thought it would be so small. You know, I figured there'd be enough arcades where people would want to go, you know, people to hang out, or bars. You, know, you could have a drink in one hand and play a game with another. Just entertainment. But no matter what happens, the people who were there in the beginning will never forget the time when a quarter was all you needed to be a gamer. Actually, it's great making the games because uh, 
for one thing, we were all a little club. There were about 150 game creators in the entire business at that point. We mostly knew each other, too, whether we were at Atari or Williams or Bally or the like. When you went to an arcade, there was this great rush you'd get because you'd make your game and you'd put it in there with all the other new games, usually by guys that you knew, and you'd see just how much money your game could make in one week. It was great. Oh, that was always a really good feeling. More importantly is when you go in there and see the expressions of the people's faces. I remember the first time we tested Millipede and some gal walked up and she was a centipede player and she was very good at it. And she got to the point where, you know, all the insects were flying down the screen and it just expression of face of, oh, you know, it's like, ah, panic. That was worth it for a game designer and for, you know, testing. That's the kind of expression you want to pull off. What you can't get, of course, and, and this is what I really miss about arcades, is just the notion of going into this crazy, dark, loud place. It's just lit by screens and filled with all the music of the games and, you know, sticky coke on the floor and stuff like that. I mean, to me, that's just uh, an amazing experience that you can never really have again.